This is your Libertarian Crusaders episode number 26. And today we have Titus Folks from uh, Students for Life here with us. And we're going to talk about uh, the pro-life issues. It's um, here, in, I guess, across the country nationally. It's the 40 Days uh, March for Life. And that's kicked off over on Lent. And I think it'll end uh, on Easter, right? I believe so. Right. And so I just want to thanks for, for coming aboard. Uh, you're not that far away. And it's great to finally have you here to talk about a great issue of us that kind of uh, correlates with a lot of stuff that happened recently, like the March for Life in D.C. and the one in Richmond. And you do a lot of good job in this area of activism. Can you tell us a little bit what uh, Students for Life is and the kind of work you do? Yeah. So Students for Life, uh, we have 1,300 student chapters, and we're mostly focused on the ministry and education side of the issue. Um, so, for example, I went to Liberty University, and we have some good um, student codes of conduct. Uh, one of those is no sex before marriage. But what was happening was um, we had students who were getting pregnant and would get kicked off the dorms, which is making women more vulnerable. So the pro-life club was trying to combat this, and then Students for Life was able to come in and, as an outside organization, pressure the school to change the policy. Hmm. So we do a lot of stuff like that, a lot of pro-life apologetics trainings, um, a lot of... Um, a lot of like regional regional conferences where we train the students how to run a pro-life club, how to build your leadership, um, how to get engaged in sidewalk counseling outside of Planned Parenthood, where you're going outside and praying, and then also offering resources, trying to convince people to keep their children. Um, so it's a lot of preparing students to do that type of activism they want. Um, and that we've been around for, I mean, in some form for like 30 years. Um, but last year we launched a 501c4, which we were already doing some lobbying um, with Students for Life. Um, but it wasn't completely above board with the IRS. We didn't want to get in trouble. And so we launched this new organization, which also has an elections focus. So most of our organization is focused on the education and uh, ministry side of it. But we're expanding over towards the more p traditional political uh, route. So like uh, our groups are very different from like a college Republicans or Turning Point Young Americans for Freedom, where all those groups, your students are interchangeable. Like they could be in any of those. Mm -hmm. Ours, it's mostly like it's usually nine to one female to male, which is the opposite of most political clubs. Um, they're usually big hearted uh, women who want to support other pregnant women on campus and they don't like conflict. So it's, it's very different than the traditional p political club. So we're often not in those circles. Like we're not showing up to CPAC as much. We're not going to these traditional political events because they're not, that's not our, our, our lane, so to speak. Hmm. I mean, a nine to one ratio. I mean, that'd be a good place for like a Catholic guy to go in there and right. find out to be a suited <laughs> in terms of finding marriage and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I have heard this one university, I think out west, in which like they're trying to solve this problem. Like uh, if you're pregnant and a student, they created this off housing where they can live with nuns. Have you heard oh, of this? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so like so they'll give you housing, uh, but you'll live with nuns, and uh, they'll help you as well. You know, they've been they're retired nuns, so that's what it is. So they'll help you along uh, with your life and everything that you need. But you get housing, and you get someone who can help you along the way. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest problem is the, you know, I think the despair and the, the fear that goes along with, like, a girl who gets pregnant and then can't, you know. And for a long time, I think the pro-life movement was kind of taking the wrong tactic there. It was, it was like taking more accusatory tactic of her rather than saying, actually, no, we can help and uh, here's a bunch of resources and because we want you to make the best decision even though, you know, this other decision is technically legal. We, you know, it's, it's not the right, it's not the, it's not the right one, you know? So I, I, I think that's been a, a good change. It seems like that's happened, you know, over the past, what, 10, 20 years, maybe. Like, yeah, it, it, there definitely was a shift. I mean, it's easy to villainize movements and it's hard to measure like, well, how do these people respond to these situations? But I think, um, most people in the, in the generic pro-life movement right now are trying to focus on ministry, supportive services, opening pregnant resource centers, that kind of stuff. Right. Right, like here's uh, alternatively where you could go for help, alternatively uh, adoption centers, things like that, uh, resources for those nine weeks if you don't want to carry it, you know, yeah. uh, alternatives and just saying like, you got to keep that baby. Uh, yeah, and like 40 Days for Life, um, which is going on right now where they're doing sidewalk counseling, when people imagine people outside of a Planned Parenthood, they imagine people yelling, telling them to go to hell. And there are people who are who are doing that. I'm not going to say that doesn't happen at all. But most of what happens with 40 Days for Life is they actually have a stance against graphic images, which I'm actually okay with in some circumstances. Um, but they have a stance against that. It's all about offering resources. They're literally just there. And what they'll do is have one or two people speak at a time. So they might have 15 people, but to avoid commotion, right. they'll have most of these people praying and one person reaching out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all geared towards, hey, please come talk to us. We have resources. These are the local pregnancy resource centers. Um, and most of these resource centers will offer two to three months um, living expenses, which 
it could be more, but that's usually what they can afford and cover the cost of the pregnancy. And that's usually what they're trying to offer. And if they had more donations, they obviously could, they could do more, but that's at least a start for it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of heavy emphasis to senior though. So wait till your marriage, uh, and all this, uh, which, which makes sense, but I think there's, um, maybe a lack in area of trying to explain why this is important or, you know, preventative measures, right. in such a way that you understand not just, uh, like that is not kind of supportive of statistics and facts that they'll say, like, for example, uh, the more, uh, non-married partners that you have, uh, before you get married, anywhere like after like the, the fourth one uh, that they show, like your compatibility to pair bond with someone starts to drop, right? Uh, you'll find that eventually they'll get more likelihood in uh, cases of, not that saying like this is 100%, they'll, they'll say 75% more likely for divorce and unhappiness. Mm-hmm. And then, so you can kind of go back to seeing like why the church uh, or in their statements will say why it's important uh, to wait until you find someone to get married. And you'll find then that. Um, that is substantiated with a lot of other facts and statistics that will lead you to a happier marriage and long lasting and less likely for a divorce. Um, and that's kind of good facts to kind of go along with it for someone to say, yeah, actually, do I really want to risk that? You know, or do I ultimately, yeah, I do want to get married and I want it to be uh, happy and long lasting. And I think yeah. that's uh, like other stuff that sometimes it doesn't go along with uh, uh, the talks that they'll say, like, wait to your marriage. And yeah, cause they'll talk about finances, they'll talk about um, pregnancy, they'll talk about STDs, but you're right, they don't talk about the pair bonding aspect. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's more taboo even, actually, to talk about. Right. There's a lot of people who are probably in the audience who are adults who are probably affected by that, who hadn't thought about that. Right. And then, you know, when a girl is like with her um, 15th, 15th partner and she, she can't understand why she can't keep a guy, maybe it's like... Um, not to say her case is lost, but you know, maybe this is a good way for her to understand why this is happening and maybe sort of just like sleep right into a relationship and wait and understand how, um, how all this stuff kind of works, even at a biological level, uh, which kind of makes sense because women have, um, more of a, I guess, I don't know what it is, bonding chemicals or that kind of yeah. experience what they need because they're going to produce children that they have to have that kind of bonding elemental relationship, uh, more so than guys do. Uh, I think guys are more biologically goes towards handling stress uh, in those situations because throughout evolutionary history, we have to go out in stressful environments mm-hmm. that can be very dangerous and harmful. And so we have to kind of be kind of stoic sometimes about those situations. So yeah, so biologically different, I think. It's kind of like, uh, I always come back to like this Game of Thrones show where like nobody knows why we have these traditions, why we have these varying steel swords because they forgot <laughs> to tell them like, this is what we use back then to kind of to just feed our enemies and to survive. Um, and it's, I think, Going back to tradition is good, and I think they had it right the first time. Uh, they still have it right, and I think a better exploration of that now, backed by a lot of studies, shows like, yeah, this is like like why we should have a day of rest on uh, Sundays, right? <laughs> uh, that's very important. The Russians tried to get rid of that uh, a few years back for like twenty like seven years, and it didn't work. Um, but yeah, I think uh, going into that and showing that pair bonding is a problem if you continue to have more extramarital relationships. Um, is that something that, uh, I don't know, students yeah. for life or. So we, we do have a stance on abstinence. Like when I signed on my contract as an employee, I had a promise not to have sex before marriage, which is kind of unusual for a company. Hmm. Um, but so like, there's that aspect we do promote when we do the March for life and we do our summits. We also pass out information about abstinence. Um, but it's not something we like, we, we, we talk about it and we'll talk, we won't do speaking tours on that topic, honestly, mm-hmm. like, cause that's, that's a very controversial topic in and of itself. And that can distract from the main one, right. but we, we will bring it up. Like we have a, a set stance. I mean, we believe we should wait for marriage, wait till marriage. We do fight, um, comprehensive sex ed, which is different from just sex ed. That's where it's actually integrated in all the subjects. Um, and in Washington state right now, we're doing a lot of lobbying against the, the sex ed that Planned Parenthood is pushing, um, for that reason. And also that gives Planned Parenthood influence that carries over other things, but right. Because like we were talking about like abortions, we we're talking about people who, are, of course, obviously are not married, and and well, no, not not always. But. For, for the most part, I would say, yeah. right? These people, I don't, I can't imagine someone who's married would want to get an abortion. I mean, it happens well, from time to time. Really, I mean, yeah. there's definitely instances where, when, when you look at, um, say, in vitro fertilization, where they have six embryos and they implant them all at one time, and then uh, too many of them grow into oh, wow. babies and then yeah. they have to decide which one they want to keep and which they don't and so it's 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 a whole new you know it's a brave new world type of situation but that's one example of like uh an abortion that that is a, is a result of 
that. It's just very early stage, you know? And so, um, but it, I mean, and you hear about these sex selective abortions too, with, mm. um, especially uh, uh, certain families from like Asia will come to the United States or UK and they, they definitely hold different values about, you know, whether they want a girl or a boy. And if right. they really want a boy, then they're going to keep skipping over the, the girls until they get one. Mm. So. So I just did a quick search, and I, it's the first study, so I'm not vetting this is the most accurate yeah. thing. But it says like 25 percent of abortions are to married couples. Married, married couples. So yeah. yeah. So I mean that's still that's still minority. Right. Um, and the, the biggest demographic, it, I think it's 45 percent, is uh, college students, which is why we focus on students for life because we're directly ministering to people who are in in this process in this context. Right. So um, that's like the the big uh, like uh, wound area. It's like the plurality right. is probably college age women. Mm-hmm. The concentration of the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good place to focus. Mm. So, right. Uh, what do you, what what is uh in terms of like uh, like other stuff that they offer? I guess um, Planned Parenthood. Like they kind of have they kind of go towards that. Uh, I'm going to talk about like the history of Planned Parenthood. I've, I've always wanted to research this, but I always kind of forget. Like they say, like it has some like bad. Uh, eugenesis. Eugenesis. Yeah. Right. It's... Could you do, you do you know much about that? Yeah, I don't. I did. I did. I'm. I'm more of an activist than a, an expert, but I can do the basics of it. I mean, you can look up Margaret Singer's quotes. She interacted with people who were connected to Hitler. Like it's very, very, very obvious. And she has statements about wanting to eliminate the Negro race. Like it's, it's a very blatant thing. And when you actually look up this, this the, um, the article where she was discussing wanting to eliminate the Negro race, what the, her words, of course, um, people will try to say, oh, it's sarcastic. And you can read the full thing. Like she was blatantly like a white eugenicist and like, um, even to this day, Planned Parenthoods are mostly congregated towards um, minority areas and college students and colleges. Right. Um, and most of them are within like a few miles of those two areas because that's who's getting the most abortions and who's promoting. Um, and I believe it's it's um, I believe the, the, the African-American abortion rate to this day is about double like the the, the, the standard or average for everyone else. All right. Um, per year, Planned Parenthood performs about like 300,000 uh, procedures of killing babies. Uh, and I think since Roe versus Wade, it's been 50 million abortions. Yeah, that's believable. I mean, it's, um, what do you think about this idea where, I mean, you, they kind of set people up for failure in a lot of ways. Like if you were to create or craft a situation in which I would be desperate and in need of, and not having any money and being young and immature, college sounds like the best possible place to like set kids up for a lot of debt. And, Oof, yeah. and so they have this mountain of debt. They think, oh, how am I going to take care of a kid when I have all this debt and mm. all this stuff? The it status... seems like our, our culture yeah. creates the situation yeah. for these people as much as anything. I think the status quo has always tried to extend adolescence as much as possible and, you know, shirk responsibility. To And this is just a way that people find a quick solution to what they think is a problem, but a bad you know the bad option right yeah uh yeah universities sometimes it's like kindergarten part two or high school part two for the most part and just kind of delays uh adulthood for another four more years like going into your first year university they say well yeah you can't live off campus you got to live here uh it's like you know even though you're gonna have a meal plan we got to cook for you (laughs) right uh, and then, of course, like the last thing you want to do as a parent is send your child to a liberal school that's going to tr- go against a lot of the beliefs that, and traditions that you teach your child. You're like giving your kid off to an enemy to be brainwashed uh, into thinking like uh, anyone who's a male is uh, an enemy and um, feminism and all this social justice nonsense. And then I'll say, yeah, go ahead and sleep around. And, you know, and then you come into like a lot of these problems you have today. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a horrible thing, horrible place. Right. So, the, yeah. de- the decision to get for some of these women, like the decision to get the abortion, occurred a long time ago. You mm-hmm. know, maybe when they they decided they were going to even go to college. You know, or they decided to go there without a plan, without a plan to say like I'm going to avoid um, you know this hookup culture, you know, and, and all that. I mean, that that's a huge step that goes goes wrong for a ton of people. So right. Um, so one one thing that's interesting with that is. Most of the women you'll meet actually in the pro-life movement who are very like activists, most of them are post-abortive. Most of them actually experienced that at one time, and that's why they're involved in it. Wow. Hmm. Um, and so like m- most of them have some sort of crazy story like that, and often it'll be something even even more extreme because the more extreme your circumstances, the more likely you're to be passionate and motivated to do something. Um, so like 
people who were just involved in the pro-life club at Liberty. I, I knew a woman who was um, the product of rape and incest. Um, we knew people who had, who had been raped, and that's why they chose abortion. There are people who are just talking. I mean, there's people who choose the opposite, and they're inspired because they made the right decision. But a lot of it is heartbreak that's motivating people's continued involvement in that as an issue specifically. Right, because um, it's not all women that are yeah. pro-choice. Right? It's like more than half of them are pro-life, right? It's a lot of them yeah. like to kind of say the situation is like a woman-backed issue. It's like, that's not the truth. <laughs> more than half of them are don't agree with that for just at all. Um, majority of them are pro-life. Um, and that's something that you don't uh, particularly hear, I guess, even from the feminist side of things or from the pro-choice side of things. They might make it seem like it's an all-woman issue. Not all women are on board. There's also, there is a lot of gray, too. It's not, it's not, when we, one, one side's pro-life, one's pro-choice. That's not, they're not all, not everyone who's pro-life has the same opinion. Not everyone's pro-choice the same opinion. It's a pretty big spectrum. Um, so maybe you have 7% on either side who's like 100% pro-life and the other side's like, well, I support abortion up until birth and maybe a little bit after. Like the majority is somewhere in the middle and most of them are, I mean, the, the, the vast majority are against third trimester abortion. The slight majority are against second trimester abortion, and then the majority are in favor of first trimester abortion, all that entails. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely an interesting sliding scale of, of opinion there. So it's depending on how you count it, you can say the majority is on your side for either 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 group. Uh, what you hear often then is, for, especially from uh, liberal campuses and professors that they'll teach you, uh, they'll ignore the rest of the reasons that people have abortions, and they just focus solely on the one in which it incurs for less than 1% rape and incest, and they make it seem like these are all right. all the uh, cases that reasons of why women have to go get abortion mm -hmm. reasons but when you break it down statistically uh you find in fact these are like less than one percent of the cases the other ones would be uh elective like maybe they don't feel like uh having a kid uh, or whatever various kind of reasons but nothing that kind of puts them in like a like a horrible situation that people view to be morally wrong yeah right. and i think most people like most people support those exceptions. Um, and the reason why I wouldn't is, like I said, I have a friend who is the product of rape and incest. Her life still has value. She has two kids. She's going to college. Um, she's, she's doing great for herself. And ultimately, it's like your life is either you're a human being and you have value or you don't. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't even support the death penalty for the rapist, let alone the child who had nothing to do with that, didn't choose to be born. Um, so it, it, it really is, if it's either it's a human being, you have to have really extreme justification to take its life. Right. My uh, good friend, uh, roommate, uh, he was a product of rape. So, you know, he's alive today and he's a wonderful guy. And, uh, yeah, he wouldn't be here either if people kind of take that, uh, that issue, you know, to kind of blame the baby. And then they say it's like um, my body, my choice. That's also his body. And he doesn't, he's not choosing to be murdered also himself, right? Uh, I think that's something that goes along uh, some yeah, of the... They'll, they'll use like a, a term for that baby and they'll just dehumanize it, call it a rape baby or something. And that's supposed wow. to be like a... Oh, well, now I've just turned this into like some organism, like some crazy uh, monster or something when it's just like no different than any other person. So All right. I think whenever people are trying to oppress someone or or take away their rights or, or kill them, yeah. um, they're, they're going to try to dehumanize them. That's just part of the process. I mean, that's with that's with slavery. That's with Jewish people. That's in every circumstance like that. You That's the first step because you have to justify in your mind. They're not human. They don't deserve the same rights as I do. All right. So let's go into some of the uh, counter arguments that they kind of bring up. You know, they'll say uh, that it's just a clump of cells, for example. Uh, what do you have to say to that? Well, we're all clumps of cells. <laughs> um, but it's often, often when they'll talk about this, they'll pick four general areas that they'll approach to say this isn't a human being. They'll say, well, it's too small to be a human being. Um, well, size doesn't term value. There's people who are shorter. They're, they're, they don't have less value than people who are slightly bigger. Um, if you're born a midget, that doesn't mean you're less of a human being than someone who's, who's a full-grown adult. Um, mm -hmm. They'll do level of development. Well, a toddler still isn't less of a human being than I am. They don't have less value because of that. Or they'll pick environment. They'll say, well, it's inside the mother, so it's not born yet. Well, it's, it still is existing. It's not, and, what, and that's one thing Students for Life focuses set, will say with our language is instead of saying unborn, we'll say preborn because unborn implies it's not there yet. Preborn is it's, it, it's there, it just hasn't changed the environment yet. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't change whether it's a human being. If we change our environment, that never affects our value in any way. And the last one is degree of dependency where they say, well, it's dependent on the mother, so the mother has a right to whether it lives or dies. Um, well, toddlers, children, I mean, up until you're 18 and sometimes until you're in your 20s, you're dependent on your parents. That doesn't change your value as a human being or affect your rights in any way. 
I'm dependent on my girlfriend's cooking, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't, yeah, doesn't diminish your value whatsoever. <laughs> Same exact value. <laughs> That's good to hear you say that. Um, yeah, and you'll find like, well, it's not an argument. Sometimes they'll say, well, it's just, uh, it's not human. Uh, although it's a zygote, right? It's a zygote, but it also contains human DNA, right? Uh, the genetic code is there that makes it human, and you'll find even uh, the areas in which they'll say, well, it's not viable. Uh, but what about people who are in comas, and, yeah. right? Uh, and, and hooked to machines, right? I mean, are they viable? Or do we just let them die? Uh, you know, they also need assistance uh, outside of the womb <laughs> uh, many years later, a bit, but uh, to continue to survive, and many of them make it through comas, right? Yeah. And there's also, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation about what the, un the preborn is, and they really are, I mean, they, from three weeks, they have a heartbeat. I mean, they, their, their, their brain cortex, I think it's at, like at six weeks, um, at 11 weeks, they have f fingerprints, like it really is a rapid development. And by the time most people find out they're pregnant, I mean, it's, it has a heartbeat already. It's, it's already a clearly defined human being it has its own blood type. It has its own DNA. It's, it's definitely separate. I mean, as they develop, they, they sleep and, and are awake at different times from their mothers. There's a lot of individual things like that, where they're obviously different from their mothers. Um, it's a completely separate, unique human being. All right. So more than just a clump of cells. <laughs> I think this is like what I I guess I don't, I don't know how much this is related to this this idea, but this um, part of the reason I'm a libertarian is I look at it like, and I don't know how somebody could be pro or libertarian and not pro life, is I look at it like the state requires all of us to kind of justify our existence in a, in a sense, mm -hmm. and with the uh, the person who can't speak for themselves in the womb, they're unable to justify their own existence they don't have a bullhorn they don't have an advocacy group except for you know people like you so uh and, and there's not as many of you as there are of uh, planned parenthood people so it it seems like the the growth of the state is what encourages this type of decision forced decision on yeah. people they wouldn't engage in abortion without the state encouraging and promoting resources to yeah, and paying for it right so right i think the an area in which sometimes i'll say is uh it's legal so it's okay. It's uh, definitely not anyone here is standard of morality. <laughs> <I don't think. laughs> um, yeah, uh, but you know, some of these people sometimes will cite the Constitution. The Constitution also says you have a uh, uh, right to pursue life and liberty and happiness, and these are things yeah. that you'll be denying and to. There's of course nothing directly in the Constitution that would make abortion a right. It's something they're taking out of the Fourteenth Amendment, which had to do with ending slavery. Right. So like, it's not. It, there's nothing in. I mean. They're taking something that's meant to end slavery to say we should be able to kill children in mass. Like it's not, it's not in any ways related. Um, I'm not sure about how familiar you guys are with this, but the Equal Rights Amendment is something that's come up recently because they're trying to actually have somewhere in the Constitution they can hang this on, and it's still a stretch. But they wanted to add a constitutional amendment, and it's been something that's people have talked about for a hundred years. Um, basically, just saying there's no difference and no no legal di distinctions between men and women, um, which we. Well, I think I, I, I like I like equality, but there are some things that I think we want we want special legal protections for women on and for men on, um, like child support and for. Um, I mean, I, I support paid family leave for some, in, in some cases, which you guys are probably different on. Um, but there's a couple things like that. Where I, I don't want women women being drafted. Like there's a lot of individual things like that where I I would oppose treating us exactly the same because we do have very significant differences. Um, but the Equal Rights Amendment is was being pushed by Narrow Approach Choice and Planned Parenthood. Um, the current demographic of the uh, of, of Congress, I mean, basically the House passed and the Senate just like we're not going to consider this. Um, but they had brought it back up very dubious legally because it had passed the expiration date 30 years ago. Right. Um, and then they had five states that said, well, we didn't actually sign on to this. We changed our mind. Um, so they hit 38 states in Virginia this year. Um, and then they're starting to push it again. But that's something where they're literally just trying to find a spot in the Constitution to justify it and say, well, and it's a stretch, but basically saying, well, because men and women are equal and because the government's paying for some of men's health care, it should also pay for this. It's, it's a huge stretch, but in seven states, they've actually used that kind of weird, loose legal reasoning to require taxpayer funding of abortion already. So it's, it's an interesting, I don't know, it's an interesting huh. tactic in the first place. Ruth Bader Ginsburg came out against it. Right. So, I mean, it's not... That's Her argument hard. makes sense. Like this is something they've been trying for decades, and it's like, and many states have states have changed their minds. So you guys yeah. probably have and, to start over. And she, and, <laughs> yeah, and she she actually said, well, she pointed out 800 laws that she thought were on the books for a good reason that were different between men and women, and then she also said, if you were going to do this, which I think is a bad idea, you would need to restart. 
Right. I mean, it, you, you can't just bypass the whole constitutional pro- process because you think it's important. You have to continue with that. Now, if she would just resign, it would be yeah, great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> she would really she'd win my heart bank, after yeah. saying all that. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, at some point, like she's just falling apart. She <laughs> like give her a break, let her right. retire and enjoy what's left of her life. Like they really are pinning her up like a weekends of Bernie kind of person. It's, <laughs> it's horrible how they're treating her. They got like a fitness regimen. She's got her own tr- gym really? trainer. Yeah. Uh, for her to, she's Oof. got a book, Jane Reese, uh, Ruthberg's uh, workout sessions, and like, dude, let her watch Jeopardy, let yeah. her relax, right, That's until awful. her natural death, right? You know, well, they might need somebody to replace Joe Biden, so. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she'll probably last. So, how does the Fourteenth uh, Amendment connect to uh, abortion? How do they try to use that to justify uh, yeah. killing babies? Let me pull it up, up so you read the text for us real quick, because it's, it's, it's a huge stretch, is, is, again, what it is. But it says, you know, I actually don't know, because I just read that. I can't remember how they, how they, how they possibly <laughs> Is it the right argument. to privacy? Is yeah, they, they say it's a right to privacy, but... Um, implied right, based on... Oh, uh, that sounds familiar. Right. Well, the right to privacy, but that's, that's the fifth, I, be- I believe. So it's mostly positive rights. Like, right. Oh, yeah. I have a right to this. Yes. The Constitution, maybe? I guess the 14th Amendment, yeah, I think it would be bodily autonomy. So the 14th Amendment will say no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So I guess these people are trying to say that, well, it's my body. Uh, You're depriving me of my right to pursue uh, the killing of my baby. So that's how how they'll use the 4th Amendment to justify. And lawyers speak. Right. Right. Hmm. Uh, So, yeah, that's that's a weird stretch that they'll apply that to. I mean, wouldn't then uh, uh, the baby have... The right to life, liberty, or property, right? So they don't apply that to the baby because they don't view the baby as a, they, they view it as a compass else, right? Uh, right. What about uh, Roe versus Wade? How did that uh, come to be? It's a big question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Ro- Roe v. Wade. I mean, it, I'll be honest. I'm more of an activist, and this is something I'm relatively new to. So I don't have a good good overview of that court case. Um, well, she's uh, Jane Roe. Uh, yeah, I mean, she, you can get the, became, the basics. But. Right. She became uh, pro-life ultimately, but I guess, you know, she was a girl who found herself and wasn't able to get an abortion, so she sued, uh, like, what, the attorney general of her state or something, and then uh, it was in Texas. And, and, and uh, there's different uh, levels of it, but she didn't She didn't even understand they were taking it that far. She had already had the child by the time they did Roe v. Wade and, over, and passed oh, that. Wow. So, I mean, like, it wasn't even relevant to her at that point. And then she spent the rest of her life sp- speaking at pro-life movements and saying, I oppose this. This is not what I want. I mean, she changed her mind, obviously. But she she, she felt guilty about it and stepped up and opposed it for the rest of her life. And that became her issue she cared well, uh, about. good for her. Yeah, I, I think I read something similar about, like, the person who helped create Mothers Against Drunk Driving and then saw how far they were trying to take that. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, if you're a divorced parent going to your kid's baseball game and you're drinking one beer – that means you're a bad father and uh, grounds to have your kid taken away from you. Uh, they took it to extreme, very prohibitionist like kind of laws these days. And so the founder just kind of it's, it's, it's against that because uh, initially it wasn't that wasn't like the, the origin of it or why she wanted to get involved either. Yeah, I think I think with Roe v. Wade, the, the ugliest part of it is this whole anachronistic uh three trimester model that they came up with a bunch of guys on a on a court yeah. came up with and i don't think like was there any kind of scientific basis for that at the time or? at the time there might have been yeah it might have been the scientific consensus but it's definitely changed like yeah. science is catching up with ultrasounds like we we know that they're the, the, the basis is completely mm-hmm. off um and it's very arbitrary like one one day or two days on either side of the trimester scale um but yeah that's definitely what because they are concerned about Roe v. Wade getting overturned, it would take one one good Supreme Court justice to, to flip that balance, and then it would go back to the states. That's where they've come with this Equal Rights Amendment to push it and say, well, we need a new basis for it. And so they'd be putting it on the basis of equality for men and women, which is still a stretch, versus the viability of the fetus. So, right. There was a... Uh, so talking about Roe versus Wade, there's this uh, misconception that they'll have that, like, before Roe versus Wade, women had a go to alleys and had to meet with strange people and have these uh, horrific treatments done. And this is the barbaric life women had to endure. It's like, no, it's actually, it was, it was legal in uh, California. Now you can go to New, New York. York. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, what's kind of down to the states? And there's states like, yeah, um, we're not going to let you kill your babies. I mean, sue me. And uh, But it's not to say it wasn't accessible or you couldn't find a place to do that because before that, yeah, there was California and there was 
New York. So yeah, and it, according to Planned Parenthood's own statistics, 90% of abortions before Roe v. Wade happened in hospitals. So it wasn't, they weren't in the back, back all like right. going abortion. That's, that's horrific. Right. And imagining that happening and hearing about that happening is horrific, but it's not the majority at all. That's just them taking one instance or one, one aspect of it and blowing it up to try to characterize right. the whole thing. Right. Yeah. And that's what I'll do. Right. Uh, and they'll, they'll, again, they'll go down to the less than 1% statistics and uh, blow it out of proportion. Um, yeah. There's a lot of uh, positions to be against, uh, um, killing babies. I think you had a good one. You're talking about like, it's about responsibility. Or... Oh, well, I mean, there is a cause and effect to everything. So if you are going to have intercourse, you know, there might be something that happens from that. <laughs> the Aquinian so, model, yes, the Thomas Aquinas. Uh, right, like, <laughs> so if you're willing to take the responsibility to do the action, then you should be able to, you know, shoulder the consequences. Right. Everybody knows intuitively, like, uh, if you know you ever had friends who were a part of the hookup scene or whatever, they always were concerned like, oh man, you know, I hope we don't get pregnant because we're hooking up and blah blah blah. And so it's like even when people are using contraception or whatever, they're still in the back of their mind cognizant of this immediate reality that could change their situation completely. And it's like a huge roll of the dice too. I mean, it's not a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These people claim their science is on their side, but it's like, well, if you look at simple cause and effect, you can, uh, yeah, you can right. tell what causes this. It's right. simple. What do you think yeah. was going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> they treat it like it's an accident, right? I mean, right. It's like, yeah. uh... so the, the president of organization is speaking to her, said something that effective. Hey, if you have sex, you're consenting to possibly pregnancy. And she was a, she was surprised that all the students were shocked. She would suggest that that was a possibility. Like they just didn't they, they didn't link those two things. But um, that really is an academia. Like they really, they really do. They link, they separate sexual pleasure from reproduction, and that's something that's happened at every level of society and in culture. Right. You know, is, we know it's two completely different. What what they need is uh, realistic uh, pornographic videos where it happens <laughs> and she's pregnant. But so it's it's not like a, it continues on the process. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a twenty minute clip, right? It's maybe you could do a montage <laughs> yeah. and then she's pregnant, right? right? And then so you can maybe add that last part of the clip. You can leave that down. It's gonna, oh, and you can add like uh, like the, that last clip on whatever uh, on Pornhub on all the videos, and then she becomes <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> That's not a mystery. Him, that'll teach him cow. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas, solutions. <laughs> um, yeah, and with the fact that they offer uh, eighteen. I mean, there's eighteen kinds of contraceptives out there, so it's not like uh, it's impossible to to find them. Uh, if this is a thing, I mean, not that I'm advocating for it. Of course, go for a marriage and all that stuff, but. Uh, the argument sometimes like it's it's uh, difficult. It's like condoms are very easily found in pretty much everywhere, and I think there's an argument one time they try to make against Hobby Lobby because they're only offering like they weren't offering all of them. They were only offering like 14 out of the 18. It's like how would you be so ungrateful into saying like for free that they're offering this that they won't offer you the the other four, right? Yeah. I think one of them might have been. I don't know if Plan B is a contraceptive or that's just like a outside of the realm that's like an abortion pill or thing mm -hmm. i'm not sure um well, it's yeah. it, they call it an emergency contraceptive and they're they they swear up and down it's not an abortion but it, i mean if if you believe life begins at conception which i do then it is it's disrupting that so it is an abortion in that sense mm -hmm. um there isn't an abortion pill which actually students for life has been doing a lot to combat called re46 which you're taking at 12 weeks and the crazy thing about that is they're actually mandating it on college campuses now so like M massachusetts new york california any of the public schools will give out free abortion pills to the students. And then instead of having medical supervision, the girls will go back to their dorms and have an abortion in the, in the toilet, basically, which is, I mean, that's, that's a huge wow. biohazard for one, but two, there's, there's like 2000 documented cases in the last 10 years of people bleeding out from this. Wow. And so people are hospitalized. I think it's about one in 20, mm -hmm. um, which is significant enough that you should probably have medical supervision when it happens. And not every those, one of those hospitalizations is, leading to something else like there's a scale on how how bad those are um i think there's only been there's been like 12 recorded deaths which compared to how many people are doing isn't as significant as it could be but it, it's a wild progression and a lot of these states that are very very pro-choice this is their next thing they're doing is just free abortion pills on college campuses and that's something we're trying to reach out wow. and find as much as possible uh guys we have a population problem uh let's do a fix by killing our babies and importing uh third rotors into our country <laughs> right yes yeah, great solution yeah, well, it's um, yeah, it, you know, there's so many there's so many things that lead into it. I mean, there's so many things that lead into that decision, and and we, you talk about contraception and ways to avoid it, as as though like, 
I can't possibly be expected not to like think about sex 24 seven, you know? So I'm going to, I'm going to just, you know, go to college and like, uh, hook up with, with all these people. And, uh, <laughs> so I can't help but think like, man, if there was just a way that people could have control over their, like their, <laughs> their minds and their brains and what they're thinking about <laughs> and what they're looking at. And, and you think like, that would be a really inexpensive way to like, if men didn't look at porn, you know, that might be like a, a really great way to avoid, uh, this over sexualization of thing, you know, where, well, th- this is the culture telling people like you have to be going to college and making poor decisions. Otherwise you're, or even if you don't go to college, but, uh, you know, you gotta be making poor decisions at this age, you know, uh, it seems to lead in inexorably to this result of catastrophic, you know, consequences. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Get rid of all the uh, liberal arts programs because that's probably the kind of targeted range of people who are having a lot of these. I will surmise and throw my money down. Just transfer them all no. to farms. Just be like, are you guys going to go work on the farm now? <laughs> no electricity. Real you skills. have to cut wood. Right. And, yeah. And then <laughs> three weeks, leave them out there and then bring them back and see what they say. Right. <laughs> That'd be really interesting if you could trace the, the number of abortions to each department. I think that that's what it really is. That would be really interesting to see. I mean, I, it's probably impossible to find that data, but yeah. I am pretty sure I'll throw my money on that because, <laughs> like, they're whacking bullshit and writing BS. I don't want to curse on this so much, but um, <laughs> it's just a BS degree. It's like they're spending time in, like, learning weird nonsense and degenerate stuff. Like, well, that's the kind of people who are going to get involved in these sort of stuff. But I imagine if you eliminated all those programs, and you really just have the nerdy ones in there. Nerds aren't really out there getting laid as much as they'll say. So uh, you'll have a really good thin cut on uh, killing baby rates. And, yeah, a lot of the stuff that they teach in university is BS anyways. You shouldn't be going to school to learn uh, English, for example. Well, like or, what are nerds, right? They're, they're people who are spending a lot of their time focused on something productive, right? Right. So this is like, okay, they're using their time wisely. They're, they're keeping their mind active and instead of – uh, wallow, wallowing and yeah, uh, pointless, you know, <laughs> right. jargon online. Stimulus. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, oh, I need to be stimulated. Right. Right. Cause, right. Because you know. like the mathematical fields, the physics, the engineering, stuff like that, uh, those are actually degrees that you need to go to college for. Uh, you really need these pers- these people and their uh, higher uh, levels of thinking that you need to go and, uh, and learn from and get those hardcore degrees. Uh, the other ones, like, you can just get a degree of that on like online. You can't go online and get like uh, uh, like engineering and like oil refinery or something like that, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of the stuff is bullshit, and I will put money on that. Most of the people that are getting these abortion are kind of going these kind of waxing uh, BS degrees or masturbatory degrees, anyways. So I think there's a correlation there, and kind of helps feel because you'll find in those areas you'll find a lot of the more uh, your feminist teachers, right? They're all they're not in the mathematics fields. They're not in your engineering uh field so those are the culprits yeah not they're not accounting fields i mean (laughs) it's really important (laughs) that everybody major in accounting so (laughs) um even my i studied uh criminal justice and a lot of that is yeah social justice Uh, and unless you're going to law school it's you know it's uh not a good degree or getting one of like sculpting or it's it's a lot of liberal arts and i didn't realize that it's yeah. wild. Yeah. Well, I was thinking going to law school after that, but I took a break and now I'm doing coding. So I'm going to enjoy that. My brother Alvaro took up uh, the mantle for that or uh, the proverbial, uh, what do you do? Really erase fraud. The yeah, baton. Baton. And uh, he's graduating from law school this year. So, and uh, we love to argue together. So, and naturally, <laughs> yep. that's the field he's going into. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, a lot of this outreach that you're doing is great uh, hearing all these other alternatives. Um, at my church, uh, we're, we're doing a thing at Planned Parenthood. I'm inviting my friends. You're welcome to join us, too. We're going to do, like, a prayer and just uh, go outside of Planned Parenthood and kind of reach out to the people who are going there. Uh, so we have, like, our, our slot out there, too, awesome. as well, to kind of help participate in that. And this year's... It's, it's a really powerful experience. Have you done it before? I've never done it before. So it's, like, it's it's hard to describe, but, like, it's um, it's like you're in this place of such serious spiritual darkness that when you're actually praying and you're, you're putting some words to, like, acknowledging what's going on and, and putting yourself in the situation it, it's really a powerful spiritual experience like every time you go it, 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 it's it's really a moving experience i mean often people are crying or go there every single time like it's it's definitely something i recommend it really opens up your mind to it and opens up your um your willingness to think about the issue and engage on it like i definitely i'm excited that you're going, you're going to do that so I imagine for someone who has like a regrets or like doubt in mm-hmm. their mind and come to us and like 
and that's what you want to hear someone else right um and i've heard stories of that people changing their mind and running into these uh kinds of groups outside yeah, and that's why people do it is because they they meet people who they help save their ch their child mm -hmm. and so these people like the, they see fruit of it they see readily available like hey i saved this life and so that, that's why they keep doing it like it, it's it's a it's a very tangible thing and it's with the, the image people have in their mind is people harassing women outside abortion clinics, but really it, it, it's something where you're offering resources, you're being there when no one else is, and you're you're turning people away as they're going to kill their children. Like it's really an amazing thing. Right. Yeah. I don't think these these places offer other alternatives, but yes, kill your baby. Uh, right. <laughs> right. It's nothing about planning for parenthood. Well, they can't make any money off that. So they right. Don't do that. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, it's like they, they talk about the 3%, like Planned Parenthood, only, only 3% of what they do is abortion. Well, first of all, if you were talking about a serial killer, I'm like, only 3% of what they do is killing. The rest is mostly uh, logistics. Prep like, work, yeah. Okay, fine. But um, <laughs> the uh, but most of what that is is they count each individual condom they give out as a service in the same way they count an abortion as a mm. service. So when you give – and 98% oh, of women who actually go into Planned Parenthood at some point get an abortion with them. Like that, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty high. And a lot of it is repeat customers who go in for their, their – um, their birth control and then it fails or they maybe they get an abortion at some point and then they go back and they, they have their customer for other stuff and they get like subsidized birth control instead um but the three percent is one probably one of the most deceptive statistics you'll hear about that mm -hmm. and uh i want to piggyback on one more statistic from the Brookin, uh, brookings institute leftist organization that talks about like people will say well i don't have money for this sort of stuff you know usually if they're going in there it's because uh the relationship they're not in a relationship they're not married 25 percent you mentioned but uh you'll find then that uh, if it's a financial thing, that the Brookings Institute says, you know, if you want to get into the middle class, finish your high school degree, get married before you have kids, um, and uh, have a job, hold a job. And that's it. You do those three things. They say 95% of the time it's very successful, and then boom, you're in the middle class. Um, and it's not something people say, well, I can't have a kid on minimum wage. Again, another statistic, people like less than 4% of the population make minimum wage. It's not like everybody. Another thing that's blown out of proportion to thinking is everyone. Um, but yeah, it's something that they should look at. They, it's not magical, right? They know what happens. Uh, find someone that respects you uh, and wants to build a future with you. And you'll avoid this whole kind of mess of having um, to kill a, a human life. Um, but at the same time, in those positions, I have friends whose parents chose not to kill them, uh, even though, like I hear, even like uh, George Carlin, the comedian, uh, he talks about how his mother went into an abortion, uh, getting ready, like right there in the waiting room, and then she changed her mind, and then uh, he was born. Awesome. Now we're blessed with the what nine dirty words. <laughs> so there you Can't go. Say on TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're coming up to the wrapping up point here. Anything uh, last comments you guys want to? Well, Bring so what do you think about the abolitionist movement as opposed to, cause I'm sure you hear about this often, right? Yeah. As opposed to the side that's saying, no, we're just going to reach people where they are and try and, and try and limit and reduce abortion as opposed to the side, the abolitionist side, which it says we're all or none. Yeah. So I, I definitely sympathize with them. I, I'm, I'm not an abolitionist, but I sympathize with them because the pro-life movement has been around since 1971 and we haven't gone that far. At least it, f it feels that way. And then we have... The rate of abortions decreased, but like it's a lot of regulating, saying, "Well, yeah, you can kill your children, but under these circumstances." And I don't ever want to say have a government sanction, so oh, you can kill your children in this circumstance. Um, but they oppose any form of incrementalism, so they would say, "If you're going to ban abortion up until um, up until the heartbeat," they would completely oppose that because then you're not banning abortion before the six weeks. And in my mind, you're thinking, "Well, I can save all these people right. versus saving everyone." And I think you should get as far as possible. But at the same time, like there are, and I, I'm not necessarily going to name them, there are pro-life groups that just exist to fundraise, and then they just fundraise to keep themselves, and it's just a perpetuating cycle, and they accomplish nothing. Um, so there's groups that sponsor legislation at a federal level that never in a million years is going to pass, but they, they make they make millions of dollars doing it to continue the cycle and pay, pay lobbyists. Um, there are, there are pro-life groups that really focus on arbitrary restrictions that don't actually accomplish anything. So for example, um, President Bush made a big deal about the, the, um, the partial birth abortion ban. That doesn't actually save any lives because all it is is you just you have the abortion before they start, start being delivered. It's just a little bit more dangerous to the mother, but it doesn't actually save any lives. It's just an arbitrary restriction. Um, so I understand because of how, how ineffective the pro-life movement is, yeah. And there's, a, I think there's a few exceptions. I like the students for life is one of those. I understand saying, well, I don't trust any of you. I'm just going to push for the abolition of abortion. Um, but what they do that a lot of pro-life groups for good reason don't want 
is the abolitionist movement um, criminalizes women directly, whereas I think abortion should be criminalized. Um, the women are often victims, and there's often so many so many other things going at play. I don't think that's a realistic solution um, to, to, to put it, put in, in the, as a possibility in the first place. Um, but anyways, I, I sympathize. I actually have a cousin who's very big in that movement. He, he really appreciates it. Um, he's actually really, really wild. So um, hmm. that's like completely another story. He's, he's, <laughs> he's a convicted murderer, and then he got out, and he became a pro-life act, a- activist with the abolitionist movement. Wow. Oh, um, wow. So that's a completely different story. That's a tangent for some other time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Huh. But bringing him in to talk about yeah. capital punishment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, the work that you're doing is great. And it kind of reminds me of like the Students for Liberty and Students for Life. It's like, cool. Uh, good name. And that's been around since like 1970s, you said? or it's um, the There's been pro-life student groups for the 1970s. The current um, name is uh, only been around for 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. Well, wow. okay. So that, I think that is longer than Students for Liberty. I yeah. imagine, yeah. But it's, it's a different, it's very different circles. Those don't overlap very much at all. And then both those groups are, are interesting because they don't really overlap with any of the other conservative student groups. Hmm. Students for Life, Liberty isn't really a conservative group in the first place. Right, but, yeah, but. very libertarian. Um, well, I think uh, it's good to see uh, that outreach. So you guys have like clubs like that at universities? Yeah, 1,300 student groups. Um, we also have uh, med school and law school chapters, which because they're busier, we mostly just bring in speakers. Um, we also have an alumni group that we've, we launched about six years ago. Um, I guess it's one of those things where it exists in some form for a while, and then you actually officially make it a thing. But it's called Pro-Life Future. We have about 30 of those chapters, and those are um, young adults in, in larger cities who are getting involved, going to Planned Parenthood, doing lobbying, getting involved in the campaigns, that kind of thing. And lobbying, I think, is kind of important right now, especially because you have uh, Blackface uh, Northam, who came yeah. out recently talking about, like, even if the baby is born, you can have the discussion with the doctor post the decision uh, will be made. Decision will be made, yeah. right? Yeah, and it, it really does. I mean, there's some of those are small differences, but it does make a difference. Um, HB 980, SB 733 um, is a bill that's currently awaiting his signature. It passed by one vote in the Senate. Um, and and the mic. Oh. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> it passed by one vote in the Senate, and it was actually there was a pro-life Democrat who crossed over for it. So the lieutenant governor had to come in and be deciding vote. In 2020, he was deciding vote, um, which shows if there had been one other senator who had been pro-life, you could have stopped that mess. Um, but they actually had to, um, they had to, they had to modify it because originally they wanted to make it so non-doctors could perform first trimester abortions, um, which is a mess for a lot of reasons. But when they did they did research on it, um, they actually found twice the complications when non-doctors did it in their study, um, which is. They're, they're using at that first trimester abortions they're using the tube and they can leave matter behind and that's that's causing complications it's probably it's the main thing um they're also appealing the ultrasound requirement which is a woman has to look at ultrasound and receive some information to make sure she's informed before she makes the decision repealing the uh, mandatory 24-hour waiting period and then also um gets rid of um, hospital admitting privileges you're required right now as a plant parenthood um, to have either have hospital level requirements or having many privileges within like 20 miles and they're getting rid of that so all that's changing at once pending the governor's signature and if we had one more vote in the senate we could have stopped that all right it's weird that they want to get rid of like even the ultrasound things like they don't want to make it real for you that there's a living thing inside of you that you have a baby and there i guess maybe the argument is like well if she wants one you should be able to get it like any other uh, over-the-counter drug at a pharmacy um, but you have things kind of like uh, Accutane, like my brother took a long time ago, where they make you sign a pledge. The whole, Me too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing about it, especially for women, is uh, especially if you're going to get pregnant or already are pregnant, you can't take it, and you're supposed to sign a pledge in which you're not going to take Accutane uh, if you're uh, going to get pregnant, and you're supposed to take your blood test. And so they have these requirements because if you take it and you're pregnant or, um, or not being safe about it, you're supposed to take maybe two measures of contraceptives that – your baby could die, uh, stillborn, could become def- uh, deformed, and all this sort of stuff. So even other medicines and other areas we have uh, things in place for the protection of the mother. And I think ultrasounds should be one of those things. For that, that it's weird that they would want to take that way. They don't want to have that imagery that they want to keep it. Like like you mentioned, like like it's just a clump of sh- uh, cells. But if you yeah. see that image, like where your baby, it's like. Yeah, there, there will likely be less of that, right? And they want to keep—they want to say it's purely a medical procedure, but they don't want it to hold the same medical standards as everything else, right? Which is—it's which is, a wild contradiction that they get away with, right? Hmm. Could they be any better at contradicting them, themselves constantly? Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's getting pretty bad, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to 
thank you for coming on the show and talking about uh, pro-life. This has been a good topic for all of us and something that was inevitably something we would have to talk about. And given the prospect Jensburg passing away, maybe someone might come in there, maybe might be a future uh, over uh, throwing Roe versus Wade in the future. Uh, we'll see how all that goes. And, uh, I, I, and thanks for being part of the March for Life here in Richmond. And next, we, want, we should go to the one in D.C. and see if we can also spot the Sandman because uh, he was there. <laughs> <laughs> the millionaire Sandman. And uh, I've got a good smirk. I can smirk really well. You know, I just have to smirk at the right place at yeah. the right time, right? Um, million dollar smirk. That's fun. We need help right in the Supreme Court. We always try to have a lot of our students there because the pro-choice activists will show up and then try to block the march from continuing. Right. So the first year I did it, they held up the march for like 30 minutes because they formed like a chain in front of it. Wow. So we'll, we'll get our students there and they'll be protesting and just keeping the space available for our side so that we can do what we have a plan right. for. Um, but we had, I had a student get assaulted and they, we did a new story about it, but like they threatened to cut her throat and like she had a knife on her and everything. It's, it's, it's wild. You guys should go go to the Supreme Court side of it and help with that aspect. Yeah, I've, mm. I've been to the Supreme Court uh, cases, uh, I think, two years ago. And it gets get kind of wild up there for that. And well, Lots I, of good content for video. Or YouTube yeah, 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 oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks again, Titus. Uh, with those listening, stay liberated. Get Don't... off my property. <laughs> stay liberated. <laughs> <laughs> and don't kill your babies. Right. <laughs> <Through that. laughs>